following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. To continue our discussion of meditation, we will remind you that the purpose of meditation is to comprehend, to understand, to receive wisdom. In other words, we meditate in order to acquire information. This understanding or this concept may be new to you because many traditions that discuss or teach meditation in the West don't necessarily present the science in this way. They may say that meditation is to reach enlightenment or to acquire powers. But in the Gnostic tradition, we go directly to the point. The purpose, the reason for meditation. We call it comprehension. This word comprehension is really significant. And in order for us to understand our meditation practice, we need to understand what comprehension means, what it is. We tend to mistakenly think that comprehension is related to the mind, to an idea, to a concept. And we use the word in this way in our everyday language. When we say, I understand, or I comprehend, usually what we're talking about is a concept, an idea. For example, we say, one plus one is two. And the teacher says, do you understand that? And we all say, yeah. One plus one is two. We understand the idea of it. But in Gnosis, the word comprehension does not mean that. Comprehension is related with the heart. To have an understanding in your mind, in your intellect, about an idea or a concept is an is intellectual understanding or a theoretical or conceptual understanding, but it is not comprehension. Comprehension is intuitive, natural, spontaneous, and it's related with your conscience, with your consciousness, with knowing something without having a reason or even logic, but knowing it because it's true and because you know it. This is comprehension. A simple example is, as you grow up and you learn about your physical body and how it works, you encounter many types of sensations. And when you experience these different sensations, you acquire comprehension of them at the physical level. You begin to understand that if you fall down, it may hurt you. If you cut yourself, you will bleed. It hurts. It's pain. That's a kind of comprehension. It's not, you don't need the idea of it or to understand why 
pain happens intellectually, but you comprehend that. You know it will happen. Moreover, when you get a little older and you start to experience what happens when you say a bad word or when you yell at someone and it hurts them, and then you feel regret and you feel pain, that's comprehension. It's that feeling, that sense, I shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. That's comprehension. And the same is true when you do something really good for someone else. When you really help someone, truly, and they show you that gratitude, and they feel and display the benefit of the action that you did for them, and then you understand that was a good act, and you feel it and you know it, even if you couldn't explain it, but you feel it, that is comprehension. This is why we learn to meditate. To have deeper comprehension of our day-to-day and moment-to-moment life. Meditation, as a byproduct, or as a means to acquire comprehension, will provide you with experiences, powers, vision, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and many other types of perception that are beyond physical perception. But those aren't the reason we meditate. Those perceptions, which are natural to the consciousness, are necessary in order for us to comprehend, to understand. In order for us to penetrate the real meaning of our minds, of our hearts, of our lives. And upon that basis... We, as students of Gnosis, develop a meditation practice. Everyone is at their own level. Every student has their own karma, their own psychological scenario, their own psychological cage. And to extract yourself from that cage can only be done when you have in-depth knowledge of the construction of that cage. In other words, there is not one key that will open all the cages of all the minds of all the beings in the world. Every key has a slightly different shape because the lock is different, the cage is different. Nonetheless, there is a key. The key is individual, formed in accordance with our karma and our psychological idiosyncrasy. But the key itself is comprehension. It's understanding. The way you unlock the knot of your mind, that tight knot of your karma, is through understanding it. This is why the Buddha said, if you want to untie a knot, you have to first understand how it was tied. And if you know how the knot was tied, then it's easy to unravel. That understanding is comprehension. Comprehension is the key to unlock the cage of suffering. But how we acquire comprehension is up to us, and only we can do it. No one can come to you and say, your mind is shaped like this, and thus you must do A, B, and C. It doesn't work that way. In order for you to undo your karma, to undo the nature of your mind, you have to see your mind yourself. You have to see the nature of your own suffering. So the key to that is comprehension. But to reach comprehension, you need to be able to see the cage for what it is. And as we are now, we don't. This is why we suffer. We suffer in a state of ignorance of our true nature. We suffer in a cage of a false self. We call it ego. We can call it aggregates. We can call it samskaras. There are many names, different languages for this structure that we've built. But for us to see the cage, we need to have a tool that gives us that vision. And that tool is consciousness. Consciousness is the basis of perception, whether physical perception or internal spiritual perception. 
Therefore, we need to know how to use the consciousness. And as it is, we scarcely even know what the consciousness is, much less how to use it. I mean, even if we know how to use it, we don't use it consistently because we're always contradicting ourselves and getting distracted, getting caught up in desires and fears and emotions. Therefore, we need concentration. We need a stable consciousness that has the capacity to remain cognizant of itself, to be stable, to be serene, and in that serenity is reflected the true nature of that mind. So that's why in previous lectures we've been discussing how to reach that serene mind. The way to reach it is to stop disturbing it. Our mind is dispersed, distracted, chaotic, because of the influences that are oppressing the mind. Those influences are external and internal. They are the intensity of our daily lives, where we are always running around consuming all kinds of impressions that are harmful to us. We go and we look at the internet, we look at movies, we look at TV, we deal with people at work and at home, and all this intense information is constantly hitting our mind, which makes the mind very agitated. Moreover, those impressions stimulate elements in our own mind stream, in our heart, that stimulate desires and fears and anxieties, a wish for money, a longing for comfort, a craving for security the resistance to exposure or shame or pride, great motivations of envy and jealousy. All of these internal circumstances, internal stimuli, also make the mind chaotic. So if we were to put an analogy, we would see that our mind is like a boisterous ocean. An ocean that is total chaotic, and there's no form or shape to the waves. They just leap and are very difficult to understand. This is why when we meditate, even if we have some serenity of consciousness, some stability of mind or attention, what we see is confusing. When we look into our mind, it's dark. And when we see anything or we sense anything, it makes no sense. And that's because the mind is so disturbed by these internal and external impressions. Therefore, in order to arrive at mental stability, we need to change those impressions, to transform impressions. And the best mechanism, the best tool that we can use for that is ethical discipline. This is why in the last few lectures we've been discussing ethical discipline. And what that means. So you can see that what we've just done is done a quick review of these three trainings. In order for us to have wisdom, comprehension, we need meditation. But for us to have meditation, we must have ethics. When we are living from moment to moment, making the effort to dominate those lower passions, fear and anxiety and stress and lust and pride and envy and jealousy and gluttony and laziness and all of those things that are in our mind. And we're making the effort to curb them, to control them, and to only express what is truly good in us, which is the essence. Then the impressions from inside and outside change. We stop reacting mechanically to everything. We start to behave in a cognizant way, in a way that will benefit ourselves and others. And as such, naturally, without any exertion over the mind at all, it begins to calm down. You see, you cannot force the mind to rest. You cannot force the mind to be silent. You cannot make exertion in order to force the mind to be serene. 
it has to arrive at that state naturally. In the same way, if you approach this ocean of our analogy, how would you force it to become calm? You cannot. All you can do is watch that ocean and stop throwing stones into it and wait for it to settle on its own. It's quite simple. It's nature. It's cause and effect. Your mind is an entity. It is matter and energy that is subject to these laws of cause and effect. There is no force in existence anywhere that can force your mind to be calm. But sadly, many traditions, teachers, and students of certain kinds of meditation try to force the mind to be silent. And all they end up doing is creating a great uh, imbalance in their psyche. You see, if they understood that if they refocus that effort, instead of trying to force the mind to be silent, if they instead took that effort and worked on their ethics, worked on observing themselves consistently from day to day, from moment to moment, and making effort instead to corral the desires, to isolate those desires, to stop them from expressing themselves, then they would realize that the mind settles naturally on its own. And it doesn't take a long time. This is why in one great uh, Buddhist scripture, it says this, Tranquility may be realized rapidly, provided one does not concern oneself with gain and similar desires, abides perfectly by the moral law, is capable of joyfully enduring suffering and the like, and makes serious effort. That's what we've been describing in the previous lectures. Adopting an ethical discipline, understanding and abandoning attachment and desire for fame and gain and security and comfort and all those things that our ego wants, and making effort to observe ourselves, to pay attention, to relax, to remember the being. And from that combination of efforts, we place our consciousness in a place where we don't have to exert it. There's a kind of inner balance or inner stability that we acquire naturally. And then when we look into the mind, wisdom emerges spontaneously. You see, comprehension cannot be forced. So, what you can see then is in this structure of the three trainings, ethics relates specifically with self-observation and self-remembering. So this is to be cognizant, to be conscious of oneself continually. To never stop. And this takes a lot of effort. See, we're trying to help us distinguish between where we have to apply effort and where we have to rest. Because there's a lot of confusion about this with meditation. Where we have to make the effort is to sustain our self-observation. To remember the being. To observe ourselves. To be aware and watchful of all internal and external events. What we call states and events. The internal aspect are called states psychological states, and the external is called events. By maintaining awareness of those, we will naturally transform impressions. And then, if we maintain this effort throughout the day, then at the end of the day, when we are ready to take a break and reflect on what we observed, we sit to relax, 
and we straighten our back, our spine, we close our eyes, and we turn our self-observation completely inward, that effort, that struggle to maintain cognizance forgets the external world and then looks exclusively inside. In other words, we forget our environment, we forget our body. We just look at the mind. It's the same a directed attention that we've been using all day. But instead of including the external aspect, we only look at the internal one. This is how we enter the second training. Sometimes we call it concentration, but more accurately we say meditation. Concentration, meditation. And this is this process where every day we make the effort to be observant of our internal states alone. When we are performing that effort, what emerges on its own is comprehension. Comprehension cannot be forced. Understanding wisdom cannot be forced. It cannot be imitated. It cannot be tricked. It comes on its own, like any inspiration in life. It comes on its own. But there are ways to make effort in order to put ourselves in the right position so that that understanding can emerge. And this is what we have to grasp. You see, this process is not hard. To comprehend is not hard. It's natural. It's normal. We make it hard because of the mind. Because we're lazy. Because we have a lot of wrong ideas, wrong views, wrong thinking. Because we have desire. Because we have fear. These elements stop us from succeeding in this effort. Many people fail to even learn to self-observe. And even the ones that learn to self-observe may not remember themselves. And even the ones that learn to self-observe and self-remember may not learn to meditate. And every stage, there are always different causes, different reasons, different excuses. But if we study this seriously, if we study ourselves seriously, it's very easy to reach comprehension. It's not hard. What stops most people is the first step, ethics. By far, the main reason most people cannot meditate is because they refuse to renounce some desire. They remain attached to some desire. It could be lust. It could be pride. It could be fear. Some people are afraid to meditate. Some are attached to a concept of meditation, to a belief or a theory, which is false. And thus, their mind remains trapped in that concept, and they can't go past it. Some remain attached to the physical body, so attached to being in the body, experiencing the sensations of the body, and hoping that samadhi is some kind of great sensation in the body, that they never leave it. And thus, they never leave that attachment to physicality. and They never have comprehension. So there are many obstacles, and it's different for everyone. We have to find our own. Some of us are just too lazy. Some of us are just too excited, too wound up, to relax. We have to observe ourselves and see and find what are the obstacles. Some of us have too much doubt. It may be doubt in the teaching. It may be doubt in ourselves. And some of us, probably most of us, have all of these things. And so this is where we start identifying the obstacles and applying antidotes to them. 
When we find that we have too much fear, we have to analyze that fear. What are we afraid of? What are we avoiding? If we have fear of meditation, it's quite illogical because we're afraid of seeing what's inside of us. Really, we should be afraid of not knowing what's inside of us. We should want to know. Moreover, some of us are just lazy. We have to contemplate that laziness. Why are we lazy? What will result from laziness? What will happen? It's inevitable. If you don't make the effort, you will get no benefits. In fact, you will become worse. It's very simple. And in this way, we approach each potential obstacle, and we analyze that. If we have doubt, let's contemplate doubt. What is the antidote to doubt? It's faith. And how do you cultivate faith? You look at those who have accomplished it. And you remember those great beings were once just like me. Full of mistakes, full of fear, full of doubt, full of pride. If they can do it, so can I. We have to cultivate an optimism. Cultivate strength, energy, understanding. So these three trainings summarize a structure of how to understand the ego, the mind. It's not a complicated structure. But it has specific details, specific information in it that can be very, very helpful to us. Specifically, when we reach this second aspect of meditation. You see, there is a strong tendency amongst Westerners to um, believe that as soon as we've heard an idea, we are that, if we like the idea. So we say, for example, well, I heard all about this political theory, so now I'm that. I like this political theory, and now I'm one of them. I am that. And we think that. Or like a religion. We hear about a religion, and we think, oh, that religion sounds so nice. I'm that. I'm one of them. It's not true. To be something is to have it in you, to act, to behave, to live that way. This is somewhat similar, in a silly example, to those people in the past who heard so much about America and loved the idea of America, but lived in Africa or in South America, but still called themselves Americans, as in the United States and loved the idea and wanted to be American and would talk about being American, but had never been there. Didn't live there. But it's this longing, this attraction to an idea that creates this tendency in us to believe we are something that we are not. And the same happens when we hear about masters, we hear about spiritual people who reach certain levels, and we all think, maybe I'm one of them. We have to look at what we actually are. Not what we would like to be, but we actually are. This is important because when we've heard about self-observation or meditation or comprehension, we've heard about gnosis, we tend to start calling ourselves a Gnostic or a meditator. But the reality is, Samuel and Vior told us very specifically, a Gnostic is Buddha. Jesus, Krishna, Moses, they are Gnostics. The rest of us, we're just students of Gnosis. We're not Gnostics. To be a Gnostic is to have that comprehension in yourself and you live that. It's your way of being. Not your way of thinking or your way of fantasizing or daydreaming or theorizing, but your way of living. This is important. As you remember, we talked about 
three types of teachings. And also there, there are three levels of these types of teachings. We talked about the Shravakyana or Sutrayana as the first level. And we talked about Mahayana as a second level. And we briefly mentioned Tantrayana, which can also be called Vajrayana or Mantrayana. Yana means vehicle or way or path. These are three paths, three schools, three ways, three levels of teaching. Samael and Vior told us very clearly that Gnosis includes all three. Gnosis is Tantric, it is Mahayana, and it is Sutrayana. And so people who study these teachings may do some practice, who consider themselves Gnostic, also consider themselves Tantric, or Mahayanists, or Sutrayanists. But let me tell you, this is wrong. None of us, let me start with myself, I am not any of these yet, but I will be. And I, I can tell you that without any hesitation, because I understand what these three terms mean. The beginning level, well, let me start with the, the highest, because many people now call themselves tantrics. And there are many who claim to be masters or teachers of Tantra. But let's understand what that means. Because to grasp this puts a very strong foundation in our meditation practice. This is very important. Tantrayana is the highest aspect of any religion. The secret aspect. It's secret because it's powerful. It is kept secret, it is protect, or it has traditionally always been very protected because of its tremendous potential. But that potential can be polarized according to the nature of our mind, not according to our intentions. And this is the critical thing. It polarizes according to the nature of our mind. Now let's look at ourselves. What is the quality of our mind? If we sincerely observe ourselves, we will see that our mind is filthy. Our mind is completely wrapped up in selfishness. Attachment to self. All of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions are about me. Thus, if we were to acquire Tantra in its full implication, that power would empower that desire, that me. We'd become demons, worse than we already are. So, in that level, I can tell you, I'm not a tantric. What about Mahayana, the middle level? Maha means greater vehicle, and this is the teaching related specifically with bodhicitta, the awakening mind. Bodhicitta is... Cognizant love for others accompanied by comprehension of the emptiness. This is a very subtle philosophical point of view, which also is very empowering. That's why it's called maha or great. But its entire focus is on benefiting others. And the central practices that define Mahayana are practices within which the meditator, the initiate, takes all of the suffering of the world on themselves and gives all of their own virtues and benefits and good karma away. Now, what happens if you give that ability to an ego? If you empower a mind like ours with that kind of skill, it will become a great big fat demon who thinks it is the savior of mankind who thinks it loves everyone but really only loves itself and wants to be admired. Therefore, we have to be sincere. Also, someone who's practicing Mahayana, who is a real Mahayanist, does every single action for others. 
Their every thought, their every act, their every emotion is concerned with and aware of other people. But let's observe ourselves. Do we have that? When we look into our own mind stream, even if we do have a thought about someone else or a longing to help someone else, it's always accompanied by, yeah, I'll look good. Yeah, they'll think I'm really generous. They'll think that I'm really practicing Mahayana and that I have a lot of bodhicitta. That isn't Mahayana. That's pride. That's envy. That's jealousy. You see, a real Mahayanist doesn't even think about themselves. So, I'm not a Mahayanist. Because I see my own mind. My mind is not like that. A Sutrayana practitioner, the most basic level, this level is defined by those who are learning the preliminary aspects of any religion, such as cause and effect. If you act poorly, you will receive suffering. If you act properly, you will receive happiness. They also work to comprehend death and impermanence, to realize the inevitability of death and to realize the impermanence of all things, so that they can dispel attachment. A real Sutrayana or Shravakayana practitioner is defined by a natural, spontaneous, completely pervasive way of living that is based in renunciation. A real Sutrayana or introductory level person has no interest in materialism. None. Someone who's accomplished and fulfilled the basic introductory level of the teaching has renounced attachment, has realized that this physical life is an illusion, and they care nothing for pride, for fame, for wealth, for security, for sensation, for gluttony, for good food, for nice clothes, for fancy house and car, all that stuff. They naturally, spontaneously renounce it because they know all those things lead to suffering. All of those things are illusion. All of those things are meaningless. And what matters is the quality of the heart. That's how you see a Sutrayana practitioner. I'm not that. So we have to be sincere with ourselves. Now, why is this important? Because if we go around with these ideas, like we're great practitioners or we're in some highfalutin, Gnostic, esoteric, spiritual teaching, we're going to build a lot of pride. And that pride will hurt ourselves and it will hurt everyone who contacts us. Because negative emotions are extremely contagious. They are infectious. You see, Samael explained to us that negative emotions are far more infectious than any virus or bacteria. You know why? Because negative emotions do not depend on physical matter. They don't answer to the laws of physical matter. Negative emotions are very powerful. And observe how easily you can be infected by the resentment of someone else. When you hear a story, oh, this guy did this and that, I can't believe it. And then you start to feel resentment, even though the story had nothing to do with you. You start to feel that same feeling. Oh, yeah, he's no good. I heard this and that. Oh, did you, can you believe what he did or what she did or what she said? It has nothing to do with us, but we start to feel that pride, like we're better than them. And that resentment, like they did something wrong. It has nothing to do with us. We didn't even see it. But we're now infected with those negative emotions. So let's not call ourselves Gnostics or Mahayanists or Tantrics until we've actually achieved the level of having a mind stream defined by those levels of teaching. Now, any of us can do it, but we have to start at the beginning. We have to start with reforming our mind through an ethical discipline. And as we've explained, this is related to 
being cognizant, being observant of ourselves, learning to listen to our conscience, to learn to do what is right. And we learn more about that by studying the teachings, by studying the scriptures, by studying the lives of the great masters. So we can start to discriminate between these qualities that emerge in us. And when we reach each day, that time of day when we're going to reflect on our day and analyze those events from the day that stand out as needing understanding, things that we need to understand more about, then we meditate. But let's talk specifically about how to do it. Meditation is not vague. It is not a process of spacing out. Meditation is not a time to escape. It is a time to reach understanding. The basic prerequisites for meditation are conscious attention. It's the main thing. And this is why we work with self-observation all the time. That is a practice of concentration. When you really learn to start observing yourself, you're developing your powers of concentration, but in your consciousness. You see, we call the second step meditation or concentration, but it's developed in the first step. We develop concentration by watching our mind. We can also use preliminary practices like working with a mantra or observing the breath, visualizing a, a given item or element, many practices to develop concentration, and these are all useful. And I recommend them. If you're having a hard time concentrating, use these techniques. They're good. But understand the principle. Firstly, we already have concentration. The problem is it's dispersed. Reflect on yourself. Look at examples in your life when you can concentrate very well. For example, when something really grabs your attention, naturally, you can concentrate on that and not be distracted by anything. And all of us can do it. But we tend to do it without awareness. For example, when you watch a TV show or a movie that you really like, you concentrate very well, so much so that you forget your body. You think you are the actor or the actress or you're in the movie. That's concentration. But it's negative because you're not aware of it. Become aware of that same capacity and use that to observe your mind. And you will have discovered concentration in yourself. It's that simple. Become aware of paying attention in that way. Likewise, when we listen to music, when we see a beautiful sunset, when we see someone we love very much that we haven't seen in a long time and we become very attentive to them, that's concentration. If you're an artist or a musician and you hit something inspiring in your work, you become very concentrated on that music or that art to the exclusion of everything else, and time stops existing for you. Or when you're working hard on something that really captures your attention, that you really are focused on, and you forget time, you forget your body, that is concentration. We all have it. Become aware of that capacity, and learn to use that in your meditation practice. Learn to use that in your self-observation, and all of this will become very easy for you. The problem is that most of our con ability of concentration is trapped in things that are harmful. Trapped in desires. Some of us are so addicted, attached to the sensations of the tongue that we spend a great deal of concentration and energy preparing a meal or going to get a meal, cooking or buying something, and then eating it and a lot of concentration indulging in that attachment. Or we use all of our concentration in lust. 
whether looking at pornography or indulging in the sexual act, with a lot of attention and concentration, but polarized by desire. Or we have that energy and attention caught up in our envy or in appearances. All these different psychological aspects that trap our consciousness, trap our ability to concentrate. So if in your meditation practice, you're having a hard time concentrating, look to see where you can concentrate and change that behavior. You see, when you can change that behavior, those powers of concentration become restored to you, become freed. This is how we gradually recover the powers of the soul, by recovering it from the desires within which they're trapped. So the first aspect is this development of concentration. There are many words for this in different languages. If you've studied Ashtanga or Raja Yoga, then you know uh, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Three terms that relate to gradual stages of meditative absorption or concentration. If you've studied Tibetan Buddhism, then you know the terms shine in Tibetan, or in Sanskrit, shamatha. And this basically means calm abiding, or tranquility. And it refers to a type of serenity in the mind an ability to concentrate without distraction. Another Sanskrit word is pratyahara. All of these words refer to similar states of varying degrees of concentration or meditative stability. These abilities are in you. They are not outside of you. This is not something you can go and get. It is not something you can force. The ability to have a tranquil mind is natural in your consciousness if you stop disturbing your consciousness. If you adopt good behaviors and abandon harmful behaviors, your mind will naturally stabilize. And there's a couple of important factors that accelerate that process. The most important one is transmutation. Sexual energy is the most powerful energy available to us, without question. It is the very energy at the basis of existence. And the sexual force is the very power to create, not only a physical person, but anything. Our ability to be creative in our work or in our hobbies or passions, the things that we love to do, is directly related with the quality of our sexual energy. And this is why in the history of humanity, if you observe the greatest works of art that have ever been produced, they were always produced by people who observed sexual purity, who were chaste. Not in sexual abstention necessarily, but chastity, sexual purity. This is directly related with meditation. And this is why all of the ancient religions always established in the ethics sexual purity, chastity. Usually, in most traditions, in the beginning, the students were required to observe a period of sexual abstinence in order to give them a chance to work on their mind, to lower the extreme disturbing nature of those energies, to begin transforming them and let the mind settle. Because if they continued engaging in sexuality with the mind so activated, you'd never have a chance to let it rest. And plus, this is all related to the former Piscean age and the way humanity needed to be guided at that time. Now we're in a new age, the Aquarian era. Things have changed. There's a new energy, a new current. Humanity has changed. The mind has changed. Now we need to harness that energy immediately, without hesitation. When we learn how to take advantage of our sexual forces and to not waste them, those energies are transformed inside the body, inside the spirit, inside the soul. Those energies rise into the mind, into the brain, into the heart, into every aspect of our physiology and psychology. They nourish 
us. They restore what's been damaged. They give fuel and energy to the consciousness. This is why if you to, were to observe a meditation school where chastity is not taught, you will see that the students are generally very disturbed. Emotionally, in life, mentally, spiritually. Unable to have experience, unable to advance, with a lot of doubt, a lot of confusion, a lot of fear, a lot of problems. Almost no practical experience of meditation. If you go to another school where they teach chastity and sexual transmutation, you'll see a totally different atmosphere. Totally different. For instance, among certain groups where monks or nuns learn to transmute their energy and meditate a lot, typically, not all the time, typically those types of people have better ethics. They tend to be better people. They also tend to have experience in meditation. And this is because of this fundamental reason. By transforming the sexual energy, by learning how to harness it and purify it, those forces saturate the brain physically, saturate the mind psychologically, and the heart psychologically, and they aid in its stability. In other words, if you really are serious about learning to meditate, transmute your sexual force. Don't hesitate. Don't go backwards. If you take up that practice, take it up and never look back. But that is not merely a physical practice. It is a psychological one. You may be restraining the energy in your physical body, but you also have to restrain it in your heart and mind. It's the heart and mind that you seek to stabilize and understand. And if you persist in behaviors related with lust, with prostitution, with adultery, with pornography in your mind, you're going nowhere. In fact, you might be making your situation worse. This is one area where you have to be extremely well-defined. And when you find places where you are not defined, fix it. The quicker you're able to firm up your physical and psychological awareness of chastity, the quicker your mind will stabilize. It's very simple. They are in direct relation with each other. In my own experience, I've observed even Gnostic instructors who have not been able to manage the psychological aspect. And because of that, they have difficulty controlling the physical aspect. And because of that, they can't meditate. It's sad. But it's entirely due to a lack of willpower. Those desires are still too strong. In other words, they haven't established ethics. Without ethics, there's no concentration. And without concentration, there's no comprehension. And this is why this type of person tends to run around and around in the same circles over and over, repeating the same problems again and again, always confused and always confusing others because they have no understanding. Don't make that mistake. Make your ethics very strong. And then your concentration and meditation will come easily. So at the end of the day, when you begin to observe this mind, do some practice of transmutation. This could be uh, vocalizing or meditating on a mantra. It can be a pranayama exercise. It can be a runic exercise. Many types of ways. In fact, if you have to meditate after you get home from work and you're still agitated from your day, Go for a walk. Get some exercise. This will help you to stabilize yourself and to let go of all the busyness of the day and focus inward. It will help. Secondly, you can do other preliminary practices like mantras. You can burn some incense, light candles. Do whatever you can to make your environment conducive to relaxing. Then we get to the meat of it the actual concentration. 
Now, while all these preliminary exercises are useful, they aren't real spiritual exercises. I know that most people think when they become spiritual, then they start doing mantras and they start meditating on this and that and doing different kinds of exercises, and they consider this to be spirituality. No, it's only the antechamber. It's only like the front door. Real spirituality is to have comprehension of the spirit, to have experience of your true nature. That is real spirituality. And you can't reach that through all the preliminary practices, at least not directly. Those experiences can emerge occasionally. But those experiences, those practices rather, are not designed to take you to those experiences. All the preliminary exercises are designed to help you stabilize your mind. That's all. The mantras work with chakras and energy in order to help everything become stable and active, awake, aware. Concentration practices help you focus and bring your mind into some degree of stability. But that's it. To reach comprehension, understanding, insight, you need a different technique. In the Gnostic tradition, we teach a variety of techniques to have comprehension. The most important one, the one that we practice every day, we call retrospection. Retrospection means to review, to recover, to analyze, to look over, to investigate. This is a form of analytical meditation. It is not the only kind of meditation that we teach or practice, but it's the most important one. In a practice of retrospection, after you've set up all the preliminaries that we've described, you simply begin to review those events that feel significant to you. You sit to relax, you forget everything outside, you take your attention inside, and you concentrate. But moreover, you visualize. This is why this second step of meditation or concentration really shouldn't be limited to merely concentration. That term can be misleading. What are you concentrating on and how? This is why the Tibetan model is so useful. So the Tibetan model breaks this step down into two aspects of the same thing, shamatha and vipassana. Shamatha is that calm abiding, what we can call concentration or meditative stability or tranquility. Vipassana means special insight. And relates to the ability to perceive and see something new, to see into something, to analyze something. So if in a shamatha type of practice, you would be just simply concentrating in order to acquire a stability of mind. There are also vipassana exercises in which you seek insight into something. But understand it's very simple. You cannot have insight without concentration. If you can't concentrate your mind, then you won't be able to visualize it and sustain it, much less penetrate into it to see what's contained there. Now in the Tibetan traditions, there are, there are many practices related to each aspect here. There are many practices of shamatha meditation and many of vipassana. What I'm talking about are the principles behind these terms. Samael and Vior called them concentration and imagination. You see, he taught the same thing. Concentration is the ability to observe something without distraction. To be focused on something without forgetting that you're focusing on it. This is generally the first hurdle. Once we've set up the preliminaries for our practice, and we start to meditate, most of the time we get a few seconds or a few minutes into the meditation and we forget we're meditating. And we get distracted and we dream. And then a few minutes 
or maybe an hour goes by, and then we realize, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be meditating. Right? This is the first thing that has to be worked on, to not forget, to remain concentrated, but also mindful of concentrating. And these are uh, specifically defined in the nine stages of shamatha. And if you look in the Gnostic teachings website, there are several lectures that explain these nine stages. A very simple concept that was taught by Maitreya that can really help you when you're trying to develop meditation, at least to the degree where you don't forget you're meditating. That's the most fundamental thing. If in your own practice, when you sit to meditate and you forget you're meditating after a few minutes, utilize that tool to help you so that you can establish more uh, consistent mindfulness of your practice and not forget you're meditating. And this is important because if you forget that you're meditating and you start dreaming, you're wasting your time. And if you persist in doing that, eventually you'll stop. You'll give up because you won't get the fruit. You'll get frustrated and you'll abandon your practice. And there are many people who've suffered this problem. The solution is quite simple. Learn about concentration. Learn about these degrees of meditative stability because at each degree, there are antidotes, there are steps that you can apply that are quite simple and they just take patience and some effort. Nonetheless, once you've reached this level of having mindfulness of your practice, not forgetting that you're meditating, then you're at a stage at which vipassana really becomes useful, really becomes important. In terms of Samael and Vior, what we would say is, this is when we really begin to unify concentration and imagination. This is also very important. You see, what I'm doing is I'm setting up levels of importance, gateways that you have to reach. You can't skip them. Don't think that you can immediately jump to a tantrayana aspect of this. You can't. It's impossible. The teachings are set up in a very specific way. And if you follow the steps, it's not hard, and it doesn't take a long time. But if you don't, you won't get anywhere and you'll abandon your practice because you'll get frustrated. So it's very important to understand these steps clearly. Now, to, to clarify that, this is only one approach. This is only one model that we use. There are many other ways of approaching meditation that expresses the same concepts. When you've reached this level of having enough concentration to not forget you're meditating, then your visualization practice will become very effective. It'll become uh, much more achievable. Before that point, it's very difficult. So you may have experienced trying a retrospection practice or trying a visualization practice, and you get a minute or two in, and then you're fantasizing or dreaming, and you forget you're meditating, and then all of a sudden, a half hour or an hour goes by, and you wake up, and you don't remember anything. I'm sure most people have had an experience like that. Well, all you have to do then is work on your concentration powers. And the best way to do that is to improve your self-observation. If we forget that we're meditating, it's because we're not mindful of meditating. And if we're not mindful in those few moments of meditation, then we're not mindful the rest of the day. Simple. So if you're forgetting you're meditating, it's because you're forgetting yourself during the day. So learn to remember yourself. Make the effort to be consistent in your self-observation and self-remembering. Imagination is merely the other half, the other aspect. In reality, you cannot separate them. You can't separate concentration from imagination. This is another mistake that some teachers make, some schools, some students make this mistake, where they try to enforce upon the student to concentrate and to reject 
images. To not imagine. This is similar to demanding that you stop breathing. It's not possible. The reason is, the consciousness perceives naturally. It's normal. It's the way the consciousness functions. You see, we all have, as I explained, the ability to concentrate. We also all have the ability to imagine. But this ability is, again, trapped in desire. I'll give you an example. If I asked you to imagine some desire that's dear to you or important to you, like something lustful or something gluttonous, you would very easily be able to have images arrive into your mind, even with your eyes open. If I asked you to remember a particular event from your life that you really enjoyed or indulged in, like a lustful event or something related with food or something where your pride was really puffed up, you could easily remember that. And all the images and everything related to it would emerge in your mind like that. Right? Everybody has that. And that's because our consciousness, which is the ability to imagine and see internally, is trapped in those desires. But on the other hand, if I asked you to imagine God, if I asked you to imagine your being, most people say, what? And they struggle, and nothing appears in the mind. Or if something appears, it's confused, and it doesn't make sense. Or if I asked you to imagine an event from your life when you really felt chastity, or when you really felt pure, cognizant happiness for someone else. You have to struggle, most people. You'd have to work at it to try to remember something related with a virtue. But related with a defect, it's easy. So here is our goal. In the same way that we need to extract our powers of concentration from our defects, we have to extract our powers of imagination. And we do them both at the same time. This is the value of retrospection. This is the importance of retrospection. In a retrospection practice, you are utilizing your consciousness to analyze the events from a given day that disturbed you. And when you analyze them, you are inverting the power upon that element. You see, that element that disturbed you has your consciousness in it. And when you become aware of it, you become cognizant of it, you're taking power from it. When you observe it and you're starting to understand it, you're starting to take power from it. Just in the same way, if you find out in your daily life that someone you trusted was stealing from you, if you become aware of that, all of a sudden, a great deal of their ability to fool you is taken away. Right? Because you're aware of it. But the more you learn about how they do it, the less power they have. And then when they discover that you know, they've lost. Right? The same thing happens with every ego, with every defect. You have to observe those egos. You have to observe those qualities of yourself that make mistakes and that perform wrong actions. And the more you observe it during the day, the more power you take from it. And the more you investigate it in your meditation, the more power you take from it. Until eventually, it's left as it should be, empty, with no energy. Then it can be destroyed. This is the gist of comprehension. The essence of it. It's self-investigation. And with every defect, with every quality of mind that we investigate, that we analyze, we extract its power and we restore it to its rightful place in our psyche. And thus, the combination of all these factors puts a great deal of energy into our consciousness, which helps to stabilize our mind and give us comprehension. And more and more and more, it feeds itself until it becomes naturally sustaining. In the beginning, it takes a lot of effort. It's very hard. It's painful. And we complain, ah, oh, when I meditate, I keep forgetting myself. Well, 
if you realize you're forgetting yourself, you're doing well. If you don't realize you're forgetting yourself, you need to work harder. And the Buddha said, if you catch yourself a thousand times being distracted, it's a very successful meditation. If you don't catch yourself at all, you need to work harder. So don't be deflated or defeated when you feel like you can't do it. If you're aware of the problems, if you're aware you're not able to do it, you're doing well. You're on your way. Deepen that. Keep looking. Don't give up. These combined powers of concentration and imagination are the entire gateway to comprehension. When these two become very strong and become one thing, it opens a doorway in your consciousness. In Sanskrit, we call that doorway samadhi. That word basically, in this context, means ecstasy. But not ecstasy in terms of a sensation in your body. Many mistake it that way, but that is not the case. You might experience such sensations, but that's not what samadhi means. Samadhi means, in its strict definition, an experience of the consciousness free of the ego. That is truly ecstasy. To feel yourself, your true identity, your soul, your consciousness, your being, without any karma, without any pain, without any desire, free. That is a true samadhi. Anyone can have that experience. If the conditions are set up, if the causes produce the effects. It isn't that some people are capable and others are not. No. Every being that exists has the capability. I will accept from no one an excuse as if they are not capable. It's not true. Every being who has consciousness can have samadhi. Because samadhi is simply consciousness free of ego. Simply that. Anyone can reach that. The obstacles are, of course, attachment, desire, laziness. And sometimes, karma. Sometimes, as hard as you work, you won't access samadhi. It may be your karma. It may be something you have to pay. It doesn't mean you should stop. It means you should work harder. The harder you work, the faster you'll pay off the karma and then reach those experiences that you're longing for. The capacity of imagination is something that's natural to us, but that we have to learn to manage uh, cognizantly. And when we do that, images emerge. This is normal and natural. Don't become identified. It's a sign of progress. When in your meditation practice, you're trying to work on a retrospection and reviewing your day, and some new image comes, it can be even sound. It could be a voice. There are different types of phenomena that can occur. These are normal. Don't be afraid, but also don't be attached. Whatever emerges in your mind, observe it. Analyze it, but don't react emotionally. And in this way, you start to comprehend those things. We've reached another juncture here that's very difficult for people. And that's, they've established the preliminaries, they've learned some concentration, and they're starting to work with imagination. And then they start to see things that don't make sense. It's confusing. At this point, what's needed is more practice, more effort, more relaxation. When those images are confusing, it means you're starting to see the contents of your mind. And it's confusing. The mind doesn't make sense. The mind we have is full of contradictions. 
and full of all kinds of information, an unbelievable amount of information. It's quite logical, actually. In your mind is everything you've ever seen or experienced, ever. Not just this lifetime, but all of your existences. That's a lot of images, a lot of impressions. It's all in there. Like a big mass of circulating chaos. So you look in your mind and you start to see things that are just all mixed up and don't make sense. You may remember dreams like that. Those dreams are your mind. It's what's in your mind. The basic idea that I want to communicate in this lecture is establish these preliminaries and begin to work with this practice and be disciplined in it. It bears a great deal of fruit. The fruit that it gives you is precisely comprehension, understanding. That understanding, that comprehension, the greatest benefit of it is serenity. The ability to love. The virtues that we have become natural. When we start to really understand and comprehend ourselves, we start to gain some foothold into letting our being work through us. That's the value of comprehension. We always wonder, how did the Buddha do it? How did Jesus do it? But really, for them, it's effortless. They don't have to exert themselves to be what they are. They are what they are. They just are that. We aren't. And to become that, we have to make effort. That is, we have to exert ourselves. But let's make the distinction. That exertion is not to calm the mind. That exertion is not to force comprehension. That exertion is to reach the stage, psychologically, where we don't exert. So philosophically, it sounds contradictory, but it isn't. And it becomes clear as you practice, as you make the effort in the right places and non-exertion in the right places. And it becomes very clear. Let me read you a quote from Samael that explains that. He says, Comprehension replaces exertion when one tries to comprehend the truth intimately hidden in the secret depths of each problem. We do not need any exertion to comprehend each and every defect that we carry hidden within the different levels of the mind. Why is that? You can't force understanding. It emerges on its own. So he explains this. He says, in practical life, each time a new problem torments us, we make many useless exertions. We appeal to exertions to solve it. We struggle and suffer, but then the only thing that we obtain is to commit inanities and to complicate our existence even more. The disillusioned ones, the disenchanted ones, those who no longer even want to think, those who were not able to solve a vital problem, find the solution to it when their mind is serene and tranquil, when they have no hope whatsoever. No truth can be comprehended by means of exertion. The truth comes like a thief in the night when one least expects it. Extrasensory perceptions during meditation, illumination, the solution to a problem, are only possible when no kind of conscious or subconscious exertion exists, when the mind does not exert itself to be more than it is. So in synthesis, we need to exert ourselves and make effort in our daily lives, in our efforts to be cognizant, to pay attention to ourselves, and to observe ourselves. And when we sit to meditate, we make effort to concentrate, to be present, but that's it. And we let what is arise. And what arises, we observe. And what passes, we observe. And that's all. Understanding comes out on its own. Do you have any questions? Do you think uh, exertion and meditation is exhortation? Because some say, oh, don't expect anything in your meditation. Uh, you want to really 
Well, what I understand from your question, there are different ways of approaching your practice. And for example, in the, also in the Tibetan tradition, they suggest that you set up a good motivation before each practice. And uh, I think it was Yogananda who said, smile. You know, when you sit to meditate, give a big smile because you have an opportunity to do something really important and valuable, and not everybody does. And that smile sets up a different psychological state. This is useful. And the Tibetans, they suggest, particularly in the Mahayana tradition, to dedicate your practice to the welfare of all beings and c convince yourself, commit yourself that this practice will benefit them. Right? And some teachers say to sit and meditate and convince yourself that you will have a good meditation. And these are all useful. But the problem is, when those intentions or motivations become desires. And then we start expecting to see something, to experience something. We start expecting a reward or to have an experience or for God to come down out of the clouds and go, yes, my child, you're doing very well. Right? That's desire. That's ego. So we have to dis discriminate between those. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions? What is the difference between imagination and fantasy? The difference between imagination and fantasy is a matter of polarity. Both are functions of consciousness. Imagination can be either mechanical, driven by attachment, ego, desire, etc., or it's conscious, driven by the cognizance or conscious will. In mechanical imagination, which is what most of, most of us know, uh, this is that ability that we all have that I mentioned, which is quite easy for us to imagine our desires and to revive our memories and to review events where we were wronged or where we indulged in some kind of sensation. This relates with fantasy, where we imagine some spectacular future for ourselves or imagine ourselves as Buddhas or imagine ourselves as very wealthy. It's daydreaming. It's, it's uh, 11 o'clock in the morning and we're hungry for lunch and we're starting to already dream about what we're going to have for lunch and fantasizing and daydreaming about that. That's all mechanical imagination. That's using those powers in a way that creates suffering. Cognizant imagination is when you utilize your powers of imagination for benefit, with virtue, with right action. An example would be to sincerely pray for the end of suffering and to visualize all beings freeing themselves from suffering. How many of us pray that? How many of us visualize that? Most of us probably visualize eating food or having sex or getting popular or you know, getting a lot of money and things like that. But very few of us imagine an end to hunger, an end to poverty, an end to our pride. And this raises a very interesting point. In this retrospection practice, it is essential that it not become uh, a damaging form of self-recrimination. It's necessary for us to recriminate ourselves. We need to be critical of our defects. But likewise, it is essential for us to love God and to love humanity. If our practice consists entirely of criticism against ourselves and beating on ourselves and always attacking ourselves, Gradually, we will become depleted. We will become bitter, sour. And this can be harmful. It's recommended, then, that you also meditate on virtues. That you also meditate on your Divine Mother. That you meditate on the suffering of humanity. That you pray. That you develop devotion. 
that you cultivate chastity, humility, and these type of virtues in your heart. So my advice to you is, when you're analyzing an event from your day that bothers you, something that you did that you shouldn't have done, or some feeling that you had that you feel regret about, do that. Recriminate yourself. You need that regret. But then, meditate on what you should have done. Visualize what would have been the right action. And pray to your God, your being, to show you what that would have been. So that you see both sides. A very effective way of doing that is to put yourself in the shoes of the other person. If you're having a conflict with someone, meditate on your part, but then visualize how they see you. You will learn something. I promise you that. You will start to see that you aren't the saint you think you are, and that the way people see you is quite different from how you see yourself. Furthermore, when you put yourself in the shoes of others, you can start to understand their suffering. This is how we start to understand the Mahayana ethic. We start to cultivate bodhicitta, that sincere wish to aid others to escape suffering. So we need to analyze things from a more well-rounded perspective. Is there another question in the back? The question is about, should we focus in retrospection on the events that stand out during the day, or should we review everything, or seek to reach that goal of reviewing everything? My own experience of this practice is that you have to learn to follow your intuition. In the beginning, it seems to me that you will focus on events that stand out to you, that you feel regret, or you feel some interest in discovering what's behind it. Gradually, naturally, your ability to review more events will grow. This means that in the beginning, if you are meditating for 10 or 15 minutes and getting something from that and benefiting from that, that time is going to start to grow. You won't be able to review everything in 10 or 15 minutes. You'll start to find way too much information. And you'll start to extend your meditation practice on your own because you want to. That's the way it should work. As to... Should you be mechanical and automatically review and retrospect every single instant of every day? No. If you have the time, great. You'll learn things from that. But my recommendation would be focus on those events that your conscience is leading you to. Your being speaks to your conscience. It's your being who will say in your heart, you shouldn't have done that. Or you missed a chance here to do something good. Or you need to understand something about this situation or that situation. You have to follow that guidance. Is there a question here? Somewhere in front? Should the mind make sense to us? Because we, we, we often we, 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 we work in our meditation. And we, 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 we go in there looking for, for comprehension. And then we, 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 we see the chaos and we're analyzing these, these, these egos. And it, 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 it doesn't make sense. Like, as is, is, is much as we try to, to dissect it, it's, it's still, it still doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't add up. Right. That's normal. When the images begin to emerge in your meditation practice, and you're starting to see things, in the beginning it will come almost like koans. Like Zen koans, those statements that are completely illogical. Uh, the famous one is, what is the sound of a single hand clapping? Your mind says, what? And the images that emerge in meditation are like that in the beginning. You start to see things that just don't make sense. This is normal. Don't stop. What happens is that there are three stages, or, or three um, levels, we could say, to imagination. And they are, first is imagination, the second is inspiration, and the third is intuition. So 
Sorry, my writing is poor. In the phase of, of imagination, in a given practice of meditation, we're starting to imagine. So we're doing a retrospection practice as an example. We're imagining an event from the day. This is the first stage, imagination. The second stage is when something new emerges, something maybe that doesn't make sense. You're seeing aspects of your mind, or you're seeing images, or hearing sounds, and it just doesn't seem to connect. This is the second phase, inspiration. This is when we're starting to gather new data. It may not appear to be related to the intellect, but there is a relationship. But your intellect can't find it. In other words, the mind can't see the problem because the mind is the problem. You have to keep meditating. In fact, you can start to meditate on that new information, the new image the new scenario that you see visualized or that appears to you. You have to be patient because you're waiting now for the real comprehension to come. And this is the part you can't force. You can't force the new images to arise. You also can't force the comprehension. All you can do is observe the scene that you want to understand. Just keep watching it. Gradually, on its own, spontaneously, understanding will come. You won't know where it comes from. You'll just all of a sudden get it. It's like a light bulb comes on. <gasps> oh, now I get it. Some connection gets made. This is the third aspect, intuition. Imagination, inspiration, intuition. These are the three parts. Some people think that these are like stages of initiation. At first you work for years in imagination, and then you get to inspiration, and you work for years in inspiration, and then you get to intuition. No, it doesn't work like that. These three can happen in one practice, repeatedly. Imagination is your act of visualizing. Inspiration is the new information that arises. Intuition is the understanding of that. Just keep practicing. Especially when you first start to visualize and you first start seeing images, it's confusing. Little by little, understanding emerges. And this whole explanation applies to dreams as well. The same process unfolds in dreaming, because dreaming is merely the mechanical reflection of the same practice. You see, when you dream at night, you're doing the same thing. You're doing what you should be doing in meditation. You're seeing the contents of your mind, but without awareness. Become aware of dreaming, cognizant of dreaming, and therefore you know how to meditate. This is why we practice dream yoga, astral projection. It's the same science. The difference is one is inside the body and one is outside of the body. Both lead to comprehension. Both lead to seeing new images, and inspiration, and then understanding them in intuition. This is why the more you meditate, the easier dream yoga becomes. And the more you practice dream yoga, the easier meditation becomes. This is the same thing. Is there another question up here? Somewhere? Yes. Comprehension is dot. In a sense, it is. But that's a little tricky, the way the question is phrased. The reason is this. Dat specifically is the tree of knowledge of purity and impurity, which is here at the level of our throat. It's that abyss between the spirit and soul, the lower seven sephiroth, and the being, which is the upper three sephiroth. Dat is that gateway. Psychologically, spiritually, dat is a door. So more specifically, dat would be related with like a samadhi. It's a doorway. It's a, it's a vehicle or a way of entry. Comprehension, though, itself as a substance is chokmah, is bina, is keter. Bina is intelligence. Chokmah is wisdom. 
and the union of those with Keter is Christ. So that upper trinity in union with Dat represents the highest aspects of the, the soul, the kayas. And so that is real prana or comprehension. So it's true, but it has to be specified. I don't know if that made any sense to you or not, but I probably didn't explain it very well. Another question? You mentioned uh, earlier in the Hadith lecture series that we should uh, leave our minds to experience the most in meditation. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're first entering into the, the state where we're leaving our bodies, how can we tell what state we've entered into versus uh, the confusion of the mind that we have and just a, a sensation, right? A certain sensation that we've never experienced before. We might not be us actually Experiences in meditation um, have to be understood in a psychological aspect, not a materialistic aspect. What that means is that instead of trying to measure an, an experience or result of meditation by the sensations it produces, you have to analyze it in terms of the psychological aspect. Samadhi itself is simply a state in which the consciousness is free of ego. You can have a samadhi in your physical body. Great masters are in a continual state of samadhi because they have no ego. And those great masters generally have to make effort to stay in the body. Not like us. We have to make effort to get out. So understanding that is important. Because samadhi is not related to one plane or another. Although you can have samadhis in different planes, this is determined by the psychological state. So it would be incorrect to say samadhi is related with tiparet. It is. But samadhi can be anywhere. You can have a samadhi physically. You can have samadhi in the abyss. Because you can go into klipoth, into hell, with just consciousness. If you have that ability. You can. And that would be a samadhi, but in the abyss. And that could be very fruitful. Likewise, with any other sphere on the tree of life, that type of experience is possible. So you can't really say that the tree of life relates to levels of samadhi. It doesn't really relate that way. The tree of life relates to levels of physicality and psychology. Samadhi can be anywhere. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Okay, see, that's a different question. That's a different question. Part of what you need to remember is that the tree of life is multidimensional. We look at this structure of ten spheres, but each sphere is multidimensional. The bottom one is Malkut. We always talk about the physical body. But your physical body is multidimensional. Right now we see the physical body at, at this particular scale. So we see a body that appears unified. But you can zoom in to that body and see the organs or go even further and see the organisms that make up the organs, like the molecules, the cells, and you can go even further into the atoms and even further into what makes the atoms. So these are levels of dimensionality within this dimension. Does that make sense? The reason that's important is because every sphere is like that. When you have an experience in meditation, it becomes tricky to identify exactly where you are in the tree of life when you have these types of experiences. And that's why it's best to relate to it psychologically. And that's why I said to not look at it in terms of matter, but look at it in terms of psycholo psychology, because the psychological component of your experience will reveal the nature of the place you are in. It may sound like an elusive answer, but when you have experiences in meditation, it will make sense to you. Um, as an example, if you have some kind of experience and you um, see an event 
Instead of analyzing the appearance of the event to determine where you are, analyze its content, its emotional content, its psychological content. And then you'll know. And the reason that's important is we're easily fooled. Very easily fooled. Even physically, we're easily fooled. Physically, we all think that we have good understanding of these things, that we're Gnostics. And someone comes along and talks very well about these teachings and says, yes, I'm also a master. We believe them. And we see everybody else thinks they're a master, so we think, oh, they must be a master, because everybody says that. And they sure act like one, whatever that means. Well, the same happens in the internal worlds, especially with our own experiences. We start to see people coming to us and asking for advice in the astral plane. We start thinking, oh, I must be in the astral plane, and I must be a great master, not realizing that that is something trying to test our pride. We could actually be in limbo. We could be in hell, being tested. But if we don't discriminate and analyze the psychological content of that experience, we won't know. This is how many people get fooled. They get fooled by their experiences because they take them at face value. They base them on materiality, on appearances, instead of analyzing the psychological content. Like in the previous lecture, the speaker mentioned about having an experience seeing himself as Moses. If he didn't understand this, he would have thought he was Moses. And then come back and said, oh, I had an experience, I'm Moses. Hey, everybody, come bow at my feet because I'm the guy. No, it's not like that. He knew enough to discriminate that experience and understand its psychological content and its symbolism. That's what's important. And that's how you reach comprehension and analysis, right? So whatever experiences you have, analyze them. Don't take them at face value. A question? To analyze the contents of a dream? To analyze the contents of, of, of a dream, should we, should we extract every piece and, and meditate on every piece of, of it? This is a, a really important question, and it relates also to meditating on the contents of a lecture or the contents of a book. I'm glad you asked. It's something I meant to mention and I forgot. Um, what I was talking about in this process of first concentrating and then visualizing something there's a very important boundary, which is what these, all these lectures have been about up till now, is knowing where the boundary is. And that's the difference between exertion and non-exertion. There is a specific limit that you have to place for yourself. And that limit is precisely here when we want to understand something. You see, when you want to understand a dream or a scripture or a lecture or investigate anything, the process is simply concentrate on it, visualize it, and that's it. That's it. You don't have to go any further than that. Now, your mind, your intellect might start to analyze it. That's okay. Ignore it. If the mind is analyzing, if the intellect is, is picking at it, don't get involved. Put your attention put your center of gravity into observing, cognizance. It sounds elusive, but this is a really important point because what people will tend to do is get caught up in the intellectual analysis and hammering on that phenomena to try to break it, to try to get some information out of it. And that's the wrong approach. That's what I'm, the master is explaining in his books. You cannot comprehend through exertion. You can't comprehend by putting that image in your mind and hitting it with the intellect. What does this mean? And I don't understand. And what about the other side? And what did this person do? And what did that person do? And how do I figure this out? And what about that other image? And what about this other part? And what about the numbers? And we get confused. We make a mess. Right? We all experience that. Because we all have a dream, and it's, the dream is... You know, a big, giant, green man with the number 165,000 on his chest. And we're thinking, oh, what was that? What did that mean? And we start going through all the books, and we start calling our friends and 
adding up the numbers and comparing them to the tarot cards. and It's all fine, but you won't understand it until you stop doing that. Until you just relax, look at it, and let it be what it is. And without expecting it, without any exertion, at a certain moment, the answer will just emerge on its own. I know it sounds frustrating because we want the answer now. It doesn't work like that. The answers that we need, the comprehension that we need, will come out naturally, not by force. So when you're meditating on a scripture, on a lecture, on a dream, on an experience that you had, just put it on the screen of your intellect, put it on the screen of your mind, and leave it alone. Just watch. And when you're patient and you do that, new things will emerge. New images, new sounds, new memories. Something you didn't expect will come out. That's inspiration. You won't understand it. Let me tell you that again. You won't understand it. It's normal. Don't expect that you're going to get it immediately, because you won't. The second stage here after imagination is inspiration. That's when those images come. We don't get it yet. Relax. Don't start forcing it again. Because people get excited. They get that first insight into something, some new image, and they get all excited, and they start hammering again with that old habit, using the mind. You cannot do that. The new image comes, relax. Just bring that image into your visualization and hold it there. and Keep watching. Little by little, another image will come. Until at a certain point, it becomes effortless. And this is the beauty of it. When you learn to be serene, to be tranquil in your inner observation, your inner visualization, the images emerge spontaneously. It's just like going over to the door and opening it and looking out into the city. You just have to go to the door and open it and look, and you can see whatever you want. Meditation works like that, but you have to have that ability to not force it, to not demand it. And then when that happens, you can just stand there and watch everything that's going by, and you wait until the understanding emerges naturally. This is how meditation becomes something that requires no exertion. No exertion, just observation. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I'm glad it made sense because when you try to do it, it won't make sense anymore. You're going to go back to meditation and you're going to go, wait a minute, what? No, I want the answer now. Forcing the mind. It takes time to train the mind. It takes time to train the consciousness to return to its natural abilities. And let me say one more thing and we'll get to another question. The entirety of these six lectures in Tibetan, it's called lojong, mind training. I didn't make any of this up. Everything I've been teaching you is established on thousands of years of meditators using them. You can have confidence in it. I can also tell you from my own experience, it works. All of this works. I'm nobody special. I don't have any powers or any special abilities. But I've been lucky enough to learn this. So that's why I'm sharing it with you because it works. It's not hard. Another question? Yes. Um, Master Kamal, in, in yoga training, he insists in the, in the part of waking up and writing everything you, you dream of. I mean, I, Carl, I, I guess I understand that it's to improve our memory. Absolutely. Yeah, and this technique that the master taught of keeping a notebook for your dream yoga practice, and when you wake up, you write down everything you can remember without moving too much because you'll disturb the ability for the memories to come into your brain. You can use that for meditation also, and I recommend it. When you sit to meditate, keep a notebook there and a pencil ready because you're going to get very stable and very serene and you'll start to see things. And if you immediately jump up and start vacuuming the house or cleaning, you're going to forget everything. It won't stay with you. So write it down. Don't show it to anybody. It's for you. But it does help develop memory. 
the ability to uh, retain those experiences. So use it for your dream yoga and use it for your meditation. Very effective. I'm glad you mentioned that. A question here? Yeah, it's very clear in some of the writings of Samuel and Vior that the use of consciousness is a polarity. And what we mean by that is if you look on that tree of life, there is a central column, right? And this central column marks all the levels of consciousness, but it also marks the polarity of consciousness. So the, the vibration of consciousness uh, in relation with the absolute. And that understanding is really important. What it shows, what it, what it illustrates, is how the consciousness is modified or vibrates according to its conditioning. All of us are modified or conditioned by our ego, desire. So our level of being or the vibratory aspect of our consciousness is very low. It's very far away from God. As such, we need meditation. We need to develop the ability to escape that conditioning. And meditation is a technique that gives us the ability to extract the consciousness out and experience what it should be, free of that conditioning. And that's the purpose of those techniques. Throughout history, there have been supplements to aid that freeing of the consciousness. And those supplements include mantras. They include certain types of prayers, certain types of exercises, and also, in some cases, plants. There are certain foods and plants that have been used in history in order to aid the extraction of the consciousness from the ego. But the application of that science has been grossly abused because people want to use them to just have experiences to just see something other than the body. And so they take mushrooms, marijuana, any kind of uh, other substance like heroin or cocaine, even cigarettes, even alcohol. These are substances that are designed to modify the consciousness. None of them take you to God. None of them. What they do is they can either activate senses that are latent or disrupt the natural functioning of the brain, sometimes both. We do not advocate the use of drugs ever. In the books of Samuel and Vior, he mentions one or two rare and specific cases in which a master will utilize an elemental from a plant in order to aid a student to see something they are stuck and they can't see it. And there are certain plants that are used in that context. But that's the only time they're used, when they're applied by a master. The reason this restriction is there is because we are 97 to 99% trapped in ego, trapped in desires. And as soon as that ego finds a way to develop power for itself, to see things that other people don't see, that ego becomes a tyrant, it becomes inflamed. And worse, the brain can be modified and can be uh, disrupted. So that's why we see among drug users, they tend to lose certain capacities in their psyche. They start to do things that they normally wouldn't do. They become a little crazy. They abuse themselves or abuse other people. They lose capacities in the brain. The cells in the brain degenerate. All kinds of problems emerge from that. The point basically is this. The use of psychedelics or psychotropic substances in humanity at this stage stimulates the consciousness trapped in ego. We don't have the capacity to use the consciousness out of the ego yet. Whereas meditation can do the same thing if the ego is not worked on. But if you work on meditation and your ego in the right way on a foundation of ethics, then you can free yourself and, and elevate your level of being. So it's really a matter of polarity and ethical discipline. Is there another question?
nothing. It's the last chance. The year is over. Okay, the, the fundamental differences between the Piscean era of teaching and the Aquarian era of teaching. The Piscean era of teaching uh, required and emphasized secrecy of the higher aspects of the doctrine. So all of the initiatic schools were closed during that era, and the higher aspects, which are include the Mahayana and the Tantrayana aspects, were all closed and only given to initiates in very specific cases, very limited. That meant that there was a withholding or a period of uh, repose for the esoteric knowledge. That also meant that groups had to be isolated in order to protect that knowledge, right? So we had groups isolated in the Himalayan mountains, groups isolated in India, in Egypt, in South America, in Central America, many places around the world where that knowledge was being protected in an isolated way. Now we're in the Aquarian era. The Aquarian era is marked by a bringing of knowledge, the arrival of knowledge, symbolized by that, that deity pouring out the vessel of water. That represents the waters of the Divine Mother, the knowledge that we need. That knowledge is given freely, openly, without restriction. Right? The entire teaching, given openly freely to anyone who wants it. Moreover, it means the elimination of the isolated groups. The Aquarian era is characterized by fraternity, cooperation, and social engagement, where the Piscean era was characterized by a withdrawal from society, by the need to go and hide in caves and monasteries. The Aquarian is the opposite. The Aquarian era, the teaching has to be given openly to everyone freely, and everyone has to cooperate as equals and friends. So those are the differences. And we need to adopt that new way of thinking. We need to allow that to emerge in our minds. Most of us, especially people who have karma with spiritual groups, still have the karma of the Piscean concept. And that's why you see a lot of spiritual groups who still restrict and restrain their knowledge and don't let people have it and have all kinds of reasons, but they don't give it out freely. Even Gnostic groups. Some Gnostic groups say we shouldn't give out the sexual teachings to the public. And some say we shouldn't give out Kabbalah to the public. But what's disingenuous about that or inconsistent is that their founder gave everything freely to the public. All of his books are free to the public, except one, which is restricted for advanced levels. And anyone who enters those levels can get them. You have to have be in a position where you can take advantage of it. It's not that that it's restricted because none of us are, uh, could use it or, or that we don't deserve it. It's that we're not, we don't need it yet. When we need it, we get it. In that form, we see that Samael and Vior gave the entire teaching freely to anyone without restriction, and all Gnostic groups should follow his example. That's Aquarian. And moreover, he didn't set himself up as some big, big shot patriarch that everyone had to bow to. He stated repeatedly, 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 I am less than anyone. No one should follow me. We're all brothers here. That's the Aquarian ethic. Yeah. So our job as students and instructors of the tradition is to understand the Piscean era, but go beyond it. And that's why in these lectures I've been bringing these traditional concepts to help explain that the teachings of Samael Contain all those concepts, but go beyond them. Right? Any other question? It won't take long. Sure. The, the, our divine mother is uh, in me. And one of the, not to come on the podium, you talk about um, one of the aspects um, went into uh, some place and he saw his mother that was Mm. That means of his own, his own situation.
situation that is spiritually. Right. 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 So if it if it's something that we we can relate in to know a dream, if if we can identify or relate our divine mother with with someone with another person. Right. I'm not sure I understand your question. Like if, if like if we see somebody, if we see someone that we love so much, and we think it's our divine mother, and it's in and it's dressed coolly and in rags. Oh, okay, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. This is the whole thing about experiences in meditation and in dreams. If you have an experience or a experience or a dream, it relates to you. Simple. Any dream or experience that you have is yours. It relates to you. Even if you see some other person it's because somehow that person represents something to you or in you or is somehow related to something in you. So any dream or experience you have, you always have to interpret it psychologically in relation with yourself. Always. Don't take them at face value. Um, I know oftentimes we'll, we'll have dreams of, let's say, a friend or a family member and we'll see them doing something bad. And then we come back to our body and we think, wow, I didn't know they were doing that. That's really terrible. They're really a bad person. I'm sorry, but that interpretation is wrong. That person more than likely represents a characteristic in you. So then you have to meditate. What is the chief characteristic of that person? How do they behave? You might discover that you behave that way and that that symbol was showing you your own behavior is like that. Don't think that the people you see in dreams are literally those people. Most of the time, they're representing something in you that you need to see about yourself. This is another great mistake. It's how a lot of gossip gets spread around. People saying, oh, I dreamed of this guy, and he was doing this and that, and it was terrible. If you hear that, you just go, oh, okay, it's you doing that. I'm glad you told me. Okay, thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.